has. I would like uh, us to come out of this room today with a clear answer to this question. Well, that would be the ideal. What will happen, we'll see. But I think it would be nice to bring some much needed clarity to so many people who are totally unaware. Some of them are desperate, some of them are frustrated, but they deserve to know. Instead of introducing the panelists because and telling you something that you already know or could read on the BSF website, I take my inspiration from Marcel Proust, and I'm going to ask one question <clears throat> of all of the participants very quickly. Uh, a brief question, and I need a brief answer. From well-known current or historic personalities, whom do you admire the most? Who is your inspiration? Who is your hero? Who had the most profound impact on you from those whom we all know? Don't tell us family. Family comes before anyone else. We know that. So who is your inspiration and why? Gordana Chomich. Zoran Zinzic. Why? Because it was a person that was half a person, half a walking ethics, who knew that politics should be all about people, and who knew with his wordings to picture the future that might happen if you work hard. A true inspiration and a carrier of modernization of Serbia, of the idea of modern Serbia. Now we know you a little better than the official biography. Ilir Dede. I mean, this Did you question. say Jesus? Yes. <laughs> no. <laughs> William Wilberforce. William Wilberforce. Why? <laughs> Thank you. Because in impossible times he led a battle for equality against slavery in the UK, but I think we must draw inspiration for people who fought for uh, values in impossible times. And unfortunately, we in the Western Balkans currently are living in impossible times. Sabine Stur, thank you, Lir. Thank you. And uh, as a German and uh, on, on this panel, I think I have to say Konrad Adenauer and Charles de Gaulle. Why? Uh, because uh, they, had, they were brave enough uh, to overcome the past uh, and to go together to a joint future. Thank you. Marko Juric. I would have to say probably Kara Georgi Petrovic, Why? the leader of the first Serbian uprising against the Turks, the Ottoman Empire. Because after centuries of oppression and occupation, he helped inspire a people to liberate and uh, create again a state that was destroyed for centuries. And uh, he was not just a national liberator because the 1804 revolution was not only about liberating Serbia from Ottoman rule, but it was also the first revolution after the French Revolution in which the feudal order was replaced uh, with a different order, with a capitalist order. Thank you, Mark. And Agon Malici. Uh, I'd say Martin Luther King. Um, and why? I don't know, there's something there that touches me very deeply when I read, for example, the letters from prison from Birmingham. Was it? Yeah. There's this way of fighting injustice through, through love. Through uh, by trying to see the good side of your enemy and not sort of reinforcing conflict. So I really find that inspiring as a way of uh, as a as a way of resolving conflict. Thank you very much for taking this challenge. Now I hope you know a little bit more about them. Uh, I've arrived in the Balkans some three weeks ago, and looking through uh, the local media, especially the tabloids and some of the social media, I have been appalled by some headlines. So I wanted to spend a few minutes here today to talk about something fundamental for all of us in this room as an introduction to this conversation. I want uh, to talk about war. Uh, I've been lucky enough not to live through a war, uh, but millions in this region and some of the people in this room have. And as a son of someone who survived war torture, I have very strong feelings about it. When we talk about peace, it's not just about not repeating war, it's also about 
overcoming wars and putting them behind. We usually look at the outcomes and we see winners and losers. One of the great uh, British American, uh, he was born in Britain, worked most of his life in the United States, historians of the 20th century, Tony Judd, he did not see winners. He only saw lo losers. And I think he was right. Those who come out victorious have uh, experiences very comparable and often remembered the war much as the losers did. People in this region have awful, a cliche, but it's a phrase, shared experiences, shared experiences of the war. Just in the Kosovo case, I can name Kruše Vogel, uh, Mala Kruše, or Starogradsko as examples. War is definitely a catastrophe. It brutalizes you, it brutalizes the societies, it brutalizes and degrades both winners and losers, bring horrors in its wake, militarization of societies, worship of violence, uh, hatred of the other, uh, just like in the tabloids what I saw, they drew very ugly distinctions between them and us, between our good culture and their bad culture, between our righteousness and their sin, portraying ourselves as noble humans and them as bloodthirsty beasts. War degrades and corrodes the norms of the civil society. Decency, reciprocity, trust in your neighbors, colleagues, community leaders. And behavior that um, is abnormal in, under conventional circumstances becomes uh, un, uh, complete, abnormal under those circumstances becomes completely normal. And war makes politics that are unthinkable under normal circumstances uh, a rule of the game. I think understanding this gives a new meaning to putting the war behind. This morning, President Vucic said that uh, Serbs and Albanians both need peace and they should put, if I paraphrase him, the war behind. I think once you acknowledge that, we are into a different game. Have we acknowledged that? I don't know. When I follow the news of the last year, when I see, and please forgive me, but when I see Marko Djuric being dragged through the streets of Pristina, when I see a train, an Agitprop train being sent into Kosovo, or when I see uh, Agon's father, a well-known uh, philosopher, being turned away at Merdare, I don't think we put the war behind. When I look at these headlines, I don't think uh, we put the war behind. Uh, war makes immoral politics the rule of the game. And to me, morality, and thank you for invoking these people, this is why I wanted to hear who are your heroes, because ethical human behavior is that capacity that makes the civilization possible. And uh, may today's West, be that Europe, be that the United States, a nice place to live and made our values possible. You know, so many history books are now coming and becoming so popular about the transitional role of, I don't know, cooking in human history or, you know, uh, daily rituals, even salt and history. But I think the biggest distinction that makes us human is decency, goodness, and morality. So I want to invite my panelists here today to show to us perhaps at least one thing, and that is what moral politics is in the case of Belgrade, Pristina, Kosovo, Serbia, and what moral politics can do. A tall order, but I strongly believe that the people in this audience, and there are many of them, and people at home, people who live in this space, they deserve to know where you're taking them. Please don't give me a politician's answer. I hope you left those hats outside of this room. I think the audience would like to have a concrete answer. What is the solution that you are envisioning? And what should be the essence of the agreement? We know the issues are tough. We heard it many times. We know that there are obstacles, internal, external. Both presidents told us a million times how much they don't like each other. But we are still missing the big picture. And we are still trying to find the answer to this fundamental question. You know, when, when the primitive man met for the first time a tiger in the forest, he didn't ask how many teeth that beast has. He asked whether this beast is going to eat me or not. So a very concrete question. 
What is the concrete outcome that you are offering to the people? Please take three minutes for each of these answers. This is the only question they're going to pose to the audience, so the, to the panel, uh, to all of you. And then I have individual questions. And I want you to only take three minutes because we, we have lots of questions. There are questions over there, there are questions over here. So three minutes. Uh, are you taking people out of misery or are you taking some people out of misery and putting some people into misery? What is the concrete outcome you're offering to the people? Let's go just from right to left. Removing, uh, removing labels from the process because we are not taking people anywhere and we are not really working in peace building in the field, in grassroots. We just label what the process is likely to be. So in Serbia, Kosovo is labeled so-called Kosovo and nobody is interesting to have a dialogue. What does it mean? Uh, in Kosovo, a lot of things are labeled in their own way, so we exchange labels. We not, do not exchange plans for the future, and we do not work in the grassroots for peace-building process. Why does it happen? Because all of this of dialogue that happens from 2010, started in the United Nations, and afterwards through different governments in Belgrade and Pristina, we label that as unwilling process. It means that we would not really would like to do it. But you know that European Union and United States and big partners and big players, they are pushing us to do. And once you put a label of unwillingness of the peace building process, you cannot expect the peace building process really to catch the, the vitality and start growing in the field. So my work will be as it always have been unlabeling the things because I'm a woman and I'm labeled and nowadays in Serbia but throughout the, the world the label is shameful if you say I'm a liberal I'm a democrat I'm peace builder I want to talk then it starts to be shameful that's another label and that kind of label I also want to remove um, there is a label in Europe that we don't need human rights, and that expression is very rarely mentioned anywhere, uh, that security is opposed to human rights, that's another label that I want to remove. And that's something what I call process of reintroducing ethics in politics. And that's what we need here in Belgrade and there in Pristina to put down all the labels that we already mount on different things and really introduce ethics in politics and sincerely speak about how people are living on daily basis nowadays and what will I do for my salary from the budget for them to live better life tomorrow or five or ten years from now. What concrete outcome are you offering to the people for this particular problem? If they want to live together, they cannot leave the label on Albanian if you're a Serb and on Serb if you are an Albanian. So you remove your labels from your hearts and from the other one and start to talk to each other. We can live side by side. We used to live side by side for decades. We can kill each other again. We used to do it. And uh, we can unwillingly uh, continue to participate in a process that is labeled like peace project with support of the European Union where people themselves forgot the beauty of European idea that is a peace project. So what's the outcome? Remember the Europe back in the 50s. Sit around the table and resolve that you will not kill each other again and resolve what kind of future you want to have together. Don't just fool us around. Ilir, what is concrete outcome that you're offering? Well, I'm in the opposition, so um, I can talk in two senses. What I would offer uh, if I were to be a decision maker or with my political and public activity, what I'm trying to offer now. Which one would you like? Um, the one that you want to see. Well, I would like to see less mediocrity, first of all. Uh, Gordana's answer was Europe, as well uh, as makers. 
Yeah, but we have to become Europe. Uh, you know, we have to be that. And Kosovo citizens don't even know what that is. Uh, I would like to see uh, a region uh, that stands up for Kosovo citizens and Albania, Montenegro, Bosnia, Serbia, Macedonia, even Slovenia and Croatia, and Greece and Bulgaria, and everybody vouching for Kosovo citizens for visa lib, first of all. You know, that's a European value which um, Europeans are forgetting to, that they have to fulfill their part of the agreement. Uh, so I have to, one. Second, um, we have been stuck in uh, the 90s in the parameters that led to conflict for a very long time. So I understand that people in the West, they desperately want to see progress uh, and sometimes superficially evaluate uh, our progress. But when you see the rhetoric of decision makers, that's unacceptable. It should be unacceptable. You know, you talked about peace and I thought about the, what's happening today between Kosovo and Serbia. Uh, you know, if, if we strive towards peace, then we should forget about saying one side loses all and one, one side wins all. In peace, we all win, right? So we cannot, uh, it's a very cheap way of addressing uh, the public opinion. And uh, uh, we have to, I believe, we have to have a predictable relationship. Uh, predictable political relationship, political economic relationship, poli predictable security uh, relationship. And I'm speaking only about Kosovo and Serbia. And we must see how do those laws that are great make fe people feel equal. Serbs in Kosovo, Albanians in Preševo Valley. Let's not forget that. Um, I am fighting uh, Ms. Mogherini and her team and everybody else who speaks about partition, ethnic redrawing of borders, because we don't live in 1938, ladies and gentlemen. We live in 2018. And we cannot even uh, now start a debate, why is this good or why is that bad? It's bad, period. That's why Yugoslavia collapsed. Because of that, a uh, quest for ethnic redrawing of borders led to millions displaced and hundreds and thousands of dead people. So you talked about uh, Krušaj Vogel, uh, Meja, Korenica, Prekaz, we can talk about Gorazdevac and uh, Starogatsko. But that, the, uh, what uh, led to those deaths? It's the quest for an ethnic drawing of borders. I will never uh, uh, condone or accept, and I'm very happy to see that at least in Kosovo, 80% think like me, <laughs> which is the first time, I guess. Uh, right. But that's good. Uh, and we will not, uh, we will, uh, we have to strive towards uh, value, uh, strive better so uh, towards better societies. It's not, uh, we don't live in, uh, uh, we shouldn't allow ourselves to be victims of electoral cycles uh, here because we have a lot of unfinished things to do. Uh, I believe that Kosovo and Serbia can uh, be at a better place if there is brave leadership and brave leadership means you tell you talk to more with more openness to your own people rather than having a recycle of vocabulary from the 90s okay Sabine you're next first um, coming from Germany I don't have to offer a solution uh, what we can offer is, is support for a process um, and of course we feel responsibility for the region and, and for Serbia and Kosovo uh, in particular. Uh, so we would like to see an agreement because it's very obvious that uh, the lack of an agreement uh, is detrimental to, uh, to both uh, uh, Kosovo and Serbia. Um, we would say that, that any agreement should be comprehensive, um, that it should contribute to regional stability and it should follow the principle of multi-ethnicity. Um, and then I should maybe also add, and I would leave it for that, uh, with that for the moment, that as a German civil servant, not a politician, I believe in hard work. Not that politicians don't believe in hard work, but uh, sort of um, talking about the comprehensivity, the comprehensive uh, agreement, um, and to become more concrete, maybe here also on that panel, 
on, on this panel, uh, we don't see so much uh, work being done on all the issues that have to be solved uh, between Belgrade and Pristina. Uh, so first and foremost, we would, uh, we would lend our support for, uh, for the hard work that has to be done to solve a lot of issues uh, that, that are still open, uh, and they are issues of reconciliation, uh, which you mentioned, but there are also very concrete issues uh, that, uh, that are open. Um, and what we believe is uh, that it is uh, necessary to sit together in a, in a good spirit, uh, in a spirit of, uh, with the aim to solve uh, the problems and really to tackle them. Um, and when it comes to mentality, I just uh, would like to say that a good compromise in our view is not a compromise that hurts the other side, uh, but is something, it's a solution everyone can live with. No one is, uh, having uh, is, is totally happy with it uh, but still uh, it's not a precondition for a good compromise that it hurts the other side so it should be possible uh, after all those years and, and a lot of talks uh, that have been done a uh, lot of already negotiations uh, that have been done on many issues uh, to bring them back to the table to talk about them and to try to find uh, find solutions for them and then uh, to solve the issue really in the interest uh, in the interest of the people thank you Marco First of all, I want to thank the organizers, not just as a courtesy phrase, but I do believe that it is still politically a great achievement for us to have here in Belgrade, and I'm proud of it as Belgrader, a panel in which the overwhelming majority of the panelists are in favor, actually, of uh, uh, a solution which is not what is our official vision of the way things are in Kosovo at the moment, and I think it is good that we have an open debate on this issue. The second thing that I would like to say is that I do believe that it is time to cut the Gordian knot, but to cut the Gordian knot by finding a compromise solution, a solution that would satisfy at least some of the wishes of both the Serbs and Albanians in Kosovo and Metohija. And for this purpose, we should do at least a couple of things. One of the things that we need to do is to refrain ourselves from all sorts of unilateral actions. As we speak here today in this hall, the parliament in Pristina is having a vote on the transformation of the so-called Kosovo security force into the so-called quote-unquote army of the quote-unquote Republic of Kosovo. After so many years of war, after so many years of conflict, without a political solution, even maybe on the horizon, someone is yet again making a unilateral step, trying to change the reality on the ground by doing an action that leads us to further militarization. This type of activity can lead us only into further escalations. This means that unilateral actions need to stop. I remember clearly when in 2012 we initiated the high-level dialogue, one of the first understandings that we had with our Kosovo Albanian colleagues was to try and settle the disputes around the negotiating table, not to do it under the table, behind the scenes, or without each other. What is happening now is not in the spirit or in line of what we envisaged six years ago. However, I must also say that uh, I do not agree that, uh, actually there is one important thing that I agree with, I first want to say with what Ilir said. No one here wants division along ethnic lines. Serbia is today a multi-ethnic society, but to be quite honest with each other, what happened in 2008 was exactly division on ethnic basis and along ethnic lines. Because when unilateral declaration of independence was done in 2008, it was done based on aspirations of majority Albanian people in Kosovo and Metohija. And in a territory in which Unfortunately, after the wars and all of the ethnic cleansing, more than 90% of the population were ethnic Albanians. 
In that sense, I want to say that any kind of solution, if we achieve it, will definitely not mean that uh, Belgrade and Pristina will remain without Serbs or Albanians respectively. And no such solution is something that we are aiming for. We are aiming for a solution that would create a new paradigm in relation between Serbs and Albanians. It is often underestimated how much of our politics here in the Balkans is about psychology and emotions, and I'm trying to speak these days a bit more about it. Uh, we need to put each other into one other's shoes more often and to try to understand each other. Uh, if we reach an agreement on two core issues that are unresolved, this is the question of status and the question of territory. And if we Serbs and Albanians manage to shake hands on these two issues, I do believe that the overall relation between not just Belgrade and Pristina, but Serb and Albanian people in the Balkans would change for better. And it would send, set another important precedent in our region. And that is that important disputes are being settled not through conflict, but through peaceful means, through dialogue, and through agreement between the parties. And we will continue working in this direction no matter what the difficulties might be ahead. For Serbia, achieving lasting peace and stability is crucial. We've got everything else more or less figured out about our future. We know what we want now as a nation after 30 years of terrible trauma. And never please underestimate those of you who uh, maybe don't have the opportunity to follow the situation here on a daily basis. Please never underestimate the, the trauma that all of us together went through as a region in the past three decades. Uh, so some things certainly definitely need time. Uh, we had here at the forum the opportunity to listen to the representatives of Austria, representatives of other countries who've had historic experiences of their own uh, with ethnic issues and definitely to heal some wounds it will take time, determination, and effort. And it will always be unpopular. Always be unpopular. Let me ask you something. Before I turn to Agon and ask him what Pristina is offering, you said something, I think, very important. So following a deal, there will be a new era, as I understand, in relations between Serbs and Albanians. What will be different? If you know the Serbs and Albanians well, uh, we are very passionate about politics, we are very passionate about history, we are very proud, we are very passionate when it comes to friendships. This means that we are good friends, but we are also terrible adversaries when we fight. And in that sense, if we manage to shake hands on a deal that would leave both parties equally satisfied or leaving with something achievable and presentable to our nations, I believe that the doors of the future, in a sense, would open. But unfortunately, I don't want to spread, you know, optimism which is not based on what's happening on the ground, on the reality. There are still too many uh, centripetal forces, so to say. There are still too many factors that are bringing us further away uh, from a solution then there are circumstances that are bringing us closer together. But the, the what will be different? What will be the different from today? You reach an agreement, you sign it, uh, it's approved, everybody likes it. What will be different on the daily basis? What will be the difference? I don't even dare to entirely dream about everything that we can achieve because the realities of today are still too dire. But if you ask Ilir or if you ask any of our other colleagues from any part of this region, uh, one of the first things you will hear is how frustrated w we get when we have to you know, stop at these checkpoints every uh, 40, 50 or 100 kilometers. And it has nothing to do with our national pride, our national dignity, our you know, national interest. It has all to do about, it has everything to do with politics and lack of understanding. 
our side, President Vucic has proposed already two years ago a very bold initiative to ease the circulation of people, goods, and everything in our region. So far, some have supported this, but still political obstacles prevail uh, in realization of, of this type of ideas. And uh, though there are people who are working to create a better climate for relations, there are still many more who like to exploit the unresolved conflict for purposes of their own. Some of them are exploiting it for domestic political purposes, and of course, uh, there are many those beyond our region who are, you know, seeing our region as an opportunity to show off their political strength or political interests. And we need to be aware of this. Serbs and Albanians, we don't need to be anybody's chessboard, no matter where they come from. Okay. Agon, what is Pristina offering to its people? Okay. Um, since I'm the only sort of civil society representative, I'm not a politician or a civil servant, I have the luxury of being a bit more uh, free in expressing my interpretation, uh, my, uh, my opinion, and interpreting in a way what politicians are doing, and not just locally, but also the international community, and where they are taking us. Uh, and I fear that the stalemate in the dialogue is, uh, is, is, is becoming very dangerous. And, uh, uh, and uh, it's both because of political interests that are interested in the status quo, uh, because they live off of it, and not just political, but other, including organized crime, uh, but also, uh, you know, so there are two forces, these, the political ones, but also there are some forces uh, who are well-wishing and who want to see an agreement but are right now concerned over the nature of the agreement, uh, especially international community and in, in the region. So uh, 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 what this has done is that it, it has increased significantly, I think, the risks, political risks in Kosovo in risking to turn this frozen conflict and throwing it into a much more dangerous external environment. Uh, but not just from a political risk perspective, uh, uh, we, we, we're in a bad moment. We're also, in terms of the values, uh, you know, I think the lack of any solution, a comprehensive solution, uh, fairly soon, will also contribute negatively to the, sort of, or, sort of, to, or will contribute to the democratic backsliding that is happening uh, all over uh, Eastern Europe. Uh, so, uh, I'm personally very afraid of where this is leading us, um, uh, the stalemate. In the short term, there are risks in the next year if this back and forth continues, if there are these attempts, you know, to sort of force the other's hands in this, you know, negotiating through force. Uh, one thing that I think historical memory will teach us about Kosovo is that very often uh, Kosovo has been, you know, Status quo in Kosovo have not been sustainable. We remember this in the 90s, you know, peaceful resistance for 10 years until, uh, until 1998, and eight, sort of there had to be a violent eruption for that to, to, uh, to, to change. In 2004, you know, uh, it was it, uh, uh, the March riots sort of rose the awareness of the international community uh, uh, in, uh, in terms of the need to uh, continue the political process. I'm not saying these are uh, exact models or the moments because right now Kosovo is a consolidated state uh, uh, internationally. Uh, it has much more breathing space. It can, you know, it, it's, uh, 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 society is not as blocked as it was back then, but we are approaching soon a moment where uh, Kosovo needs to sort of uh, finally consolidate its statehood and, 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 uh, and with uh, sort of this neglection of this internal dynamics in Kosovo, of the unsustainability of the status quo, I fear that we are uh, uh, coming to a point where uh, this could also, uh, you know, we, over the last year in North Mitrovica, we've had, in, in the north, we've had already two or three sort of dangerous situations or escalations. And I, I fear that over the next year we will see more of these unless there is stronger commitment or stronger uh, uh, sort of determination to sit down at the table and come to an agreement. In the medium term, if there is no agreement uh, over the next year, my fear is that both local politicians, including the oppositions in both countries, I think, which are not being constructive. And even though with Ilir, I not only, you know, not only are we both from Kosovo and we are both share the same values, we, are, we also 
grew up like first door neighbors, so <laughs> we have a lot in common. But I think I, I have a disagreement a little bit on this, on the opposition's role in Kosovo in terms of being constructive and, 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 and proposing alternative solutions and, and sort of coming up with uh, workable solutions to the border correction, which I agree is a very uh, dangerous, uh, has its, uh, its, its, uh, uh, a lot of risks. So I fear that we will spend the next year, uh, you know, uh, with these concerns and these politicians with vested interest in not having this solved, sabotaging it and leaving Kosovo in a, uh, you know, although independence is irreversible, it has come to a point where, you know, uh, nothing can take back what we already have, but with no EU accession future and with, uh, you know, uh, with uh, uh, sort of having a tremendous impact in terms of uh, uh, the momentum for rule of law, for reforms, uh, um, uh, lack of sort of uh, focus and priority on education, on healthcare, on what are, are, are real uh, domestic challenges. This sort of stabilocracy uh, will uh, hamper uh, our democratization. Uh, we will, uh, and also it will not help reconciliation. You know, the Brussels dialogue has, up to a point, improved interethnic relations in Kosovo. You know, it has eased tensions. But the last year we've seen, we've seen that. There, you know, this can very easily regress, uh, especially if one side takes active measures to, to sabotage, like for example, with Serbia's pressure on the Kosovo security force in, in pressuring the Serb minority to, to, to leave the Kosovo security force. So this is very fragile, and as long as this is not resolved, and as long as the Serbs in Kosovo are seen uh, uh, in a way by the majority as an instrument of Serbia because of this broader political picture, this you know, it does not create conducive uh, uh, environment for, for peace and, and, and long-term st uh, uh, stability. So I fear that both in Serbia and Kosovo, politicians and the international community by its lack of consensus on this issue is leading us to a very dangerous situation. Please, uh, I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna come to you exactly to you, Marco, now, but please take only three minutes, all of you, because otherwise we have less than an hour left and there's so many questions. So, Marco, you heard uh, that there are so many people including on this panel, very passionately against any territorial change. Please tell them, first of all, what don't they understand? What they should know that you know but they don't know? And the second question is, if you would have a chance to address the Kosovars directly, how would you bring them on board? Uh, I think Elir said that 80%, did you mention 80% of the Kosovars are against any change of uh, borders? I know that 90% are against uh, the association, establishing the association of Serb majority municipalities. So on this issue of territorial change, how do you bring them aboard and what do you tell these people who are so passionately against this? First of all, I think that we all need to be very realistic about the situation. And I think that we, while looking for a solution, must keep looking at ourselves in the mirror. And when I say this, I mean that we need to realistically assess our situation. I've heard here, you know, the argument of my esteemed colleague, one of the things he said, if I understood correctly, is that the so-called independence of Kosovo is a given, that it is irreversible. I don't believe that this is the case. You know, I do believe that the situation is such that Kosovo is not independent. It is not a member of the United Nations. It is not a member of OSCE. It is not a member of all major international organizations. It is not independent when it comes to providing security on its territory because it has huge international presence in uh, terms of uh, security missions from both NATO and the European Union. Financially, economically, it is very much dependent on uh, funding from international community and from also exchange with other countries as well. We can now enter into almost philosophical debate whether there are and to what extent are generally territories and countries in today's modern world, world independent and sovereign. But certainly membership in international organizations and full security territory of uh, for secu security control of a territory qualifies as part of the core definition of a state. And I'm not sure that in this case this definition has been uh, fulfilled by any means. 
Uh, on the other hand, as well, a part of our society likes at least equally to dream and to live in a world in which uh, everything on the ground is just as it is defined in some of our legal acts, you know, and in our political programs. The reality, in my view, is that we need to achieve a compromise, a solution that will resolve, that will tackle exactly the core issues that we have dispute on. No one will bring to Pristina on a silver plate what they expect to achieve or receive when it comes to materializing their dreams about membership in international organizations or reaffirming their position in the international community without a compromise with, in, with, with Belgrade. Equally, no one will, uh, with the magic wand, fulfill, you know, uh, our view of, our vision of how the resolution 1244 should have been implemented or how our constitution should be implemented on the entire territory of, of our state. It is clear that we require a compromise and what has been done in 2008, uh, I do not believe that it was a solution. It happened not during the era uh, of the Milosevic regime. It did not happen during the conflict time. It happened eight years after the end of the war. And there is no comparative example in modern European history that eight years after a conflict was ended, people came and asked to ask from a party to that war for substantial territorial concessions. There is no matching example in modern European history that the nation willingly accepted so. So I ask of you all to also understand the Serbian position. 30 years ago, I, uh, I already mentioned this period, 30 years ago, and I mentioned this to some of my interlocutors earlier today, we were a country of 252,000 square kilometers. Now we are a nation of merely 88,000 square kilometers, according to some even 78,000 square kilometers. It is a huge, huge historic trauma for the Serbian people. Uh, just as equally I acknowledge it is for other nations who lived in the area of former ex-Yugoslavia. This is why we need to act very carefully and to only reach solutions through agreement. And if it is something that includes resolving the question of territoriality and addressing the question of territoriality, we should not run away from it. Because if we manage to set a positive precedent and achieve a deal in a peaceful way, we would have resolved what is the major concern of the Albanians and that is, you know, the thing that they want to achieve, what they want to aspire, and we would have achieved at least part of our goals and uh, left this deal with, you know, at least dignity and part of our interests protected. Let me ask you something about the UN before I go to Ilir. Um, I'm a little bit confused. A year ago, Minister Dacic said that he does not exclude uh, a UN seat for Kosovo. This year, he says it's out of question. Can a UN seat be on the table or not? I can only repeat what I just said. No one, no one in Serbia is prepared to give the interim institutions of self-government in Pristina on a silver plate as a present anything. We don't expect any presents for ourselves. We expect a fair deal, a deal in which both sides will achieve something for, for their people and for, for their long-term interests. Uh, is the problem borders or what happens inside of those borders? Why would Kosovo, uh, the Kosovo Serbs happier now or let's say if such a deal goes, are they gonna be happier after? You know, these panels are becoming somehow predictable. <laughs> I'm very sorry to say this, but they are. Because the question was to Mr. Juric, how would he address the Kosovo Albanians and everything what he has said is so not the way how you can address uh, Kosovo Albanians and it's sad. No. What would you want to hear? Uh, no. what, what uh, you want to hear? Uh, I uh, don't want to get into this 
who did what unilaterally because the Serbian audience knows my position very well. Um, and I think we, we just have to step out of the same paradigm. Um, but I will say one thing. Everything what Marco, you said here, especially about Kosovo statehood, is in stark opposition to what your president says when he says that Serbia enabled and sealed the independence of Kosovo with asking the ICJ's opinion. So, you know, like for me, it has always been a problem to know what do pe people, people who lead this country, really think? Because there are so many contradicting statements and they are never, uh, there is, they, they're just very contradicting. And um, how do you measure a, a party by being uh, like that? You know, if you say, you know, we have decided to join European Union, and I can tell you it's in Kosovo's interest that Serbia becomes a European modern state with rule of law, with owning up to the past, with owning up to its own decisions, um, and wanting to extend the hand of peace and reconciliation to all of its neighbors. Kosovo is one of those neighbors. Regardless of what we say here, it is. Uh, then what do we aspire towards? You know, if it's the EU, then we have the Franco-German model. Uh, but we have not, we don't get that there because we are stuck in the mindset of the 90s. And you know, no, I want to say one more thing because I see Sonia here. And she quoted me in a Radio Free Europe a couple of days ago. Five years ago when there was this Brussels first agreement and everybody cheered it as this historic thing and the rest of us who were skeptical about it, it didn't get it or didn't uh, get the big picture or the usual phrases that go along with discrediting an opposition. Um, I said that I am afraid it's going to end up like uh, the Oslo Agreement. And voila, there we are. You know, the question today should be, what have Kosovo and Serbia been doing for seven years in Brussels? Seven years on discussing a normalization of relations, and most of the agreements have not even been fulfilled. What have we been doing? I mean, there is no self-critical approach. And I, in my various capacity, every time I sat and discussed with international, Western interlocutors, I've tried to push them to think critically about it. Because we are not where we are supposed to be after seven years of negotiations, of normalization of relations, you know. So what, and now we're already being uh, uh, presented with doomsday scenarios because of European elections in the spring. No, <laughs> you know, no. What we must do, obviously, we are not on the right track. And obviously what's coming from here, it's uh, an, uh, maybe this, whatever uh, the Serbian leadership government is asking, is something they feel it would satisfy Serbia, but it would destabilize the entire region, and we can't do that anymore. Marco, take two minutes, and then we'll go around. Please, two minutes. Only. Very briefly, I respect Mr. Ilir very much, uh, but I do not believe that it would help if I would say only what some people in Pristina would like to hear. I do believe it is much important that we tell each other how we feel about the situation and how we view the situation, rather than to try to, in words, appease each other. For the past seven years in Brussels, we've been trying to keep peace, and we've been, with all of the setbacks, successful in doing so, and I don't believe that this should be underestimated. The very fact that stability has, with all of the setbacks and all of the difficulties being kept, has done a good service for both the Albanian and Serbian people in this region and has at least kept the open perspective to sometime in the future find a solution. And believe me, it was not pleasant to, for more than 250 times, go there and talk about various issues in which we have directly opposing or conflicting views and interests. But we knew why we were doing it. We were doing it for the sake of the future of our country, of our people, of our region, which we view 
as something that deserves to be set up in a way that would not leave hundreds of thousands of young people leaving the area every year. Thank you. Uh, Sabine, I want to turn a little bit to, sub uh, to a different subject. There is a perception that there is a disagreement with the international community on this issue. Uh, is the perception wrong or not? If it's correct, uh, can we proceed successfully with a disagreement? Thank you. Thank you for giving uh, me the opportunity to explain also our position. And I think it's not a different subject. It's exactly uh, what, what uh, colleagues have been talking about. So we are really and seriously concerned how the aim of the dialogue is being framed. I, you can say it's the 1990s, you could also say it's the 1920s, the territory is a solution to anything. Uh, and also that it's the only solution. So um, you said that status and territory are the issues to be discussed and if status and territory are in some way traded against each other, then the solution is there. We do not believe that this will lead to sustainable solution because none of the existing problems will, will have been tackled. So uh, hence our um, yeah, still astonishment uh, about uh, that this is being seen as a, as a solution and as boring uh, and uh, civil servant-like as it might, and bureaucratic as it might seem, the issues that are on the table and that are well known have to be discussed and have to be resolved. I think it's not astonishing that uh, over the past, let's say, 14 months or even longer, nothing has moved, and we've seen just to the opposite, a deterioration of the situation in some ways. Um, because, of course, if uh, there is, um, we would call it a fata morgana, others would call it a carrot, but uh, that's uh, for everyone to decide uh, of, of some land gain is there. Why should you work on the, on the real issues, on the difficult issues, uh, on the issues where it's hard to find a compromise? So uh, that not much has moved uh, and, and was achieved uh, in the dialogue over the past months and, and maybe more than a year, this is not astonishing for us. I would also say that reactions like uh, the strife uh, for Kosovo to, uh, to secure even more their independence which is, and their statehood, which is the Pristina perspective, and we've already seen that there are different perspectives. We don't know that, we don't have to discuss it. The Pristina perspective is independence and statehood, and I would see in an in a analysis, uh, not taking sides, and, and German position has been expressed clearly towards uh, the government in Pristina, on KSF uh, transformation, but wouldn't you say that that is a direct, uh, direct uh, sort of result of questioning uh, something which, uh, which Kosovo uh, authorities and, and Kosovo seems or thinks they have achieved and that is stated, which is being questioned if you now talk about territory for us. So, um, Again, and, and now coming to your question, I don't know whether we can achieve something with that. Uh, it is also, maybe I should also explain that the German position is a little bit more differentiated. Uh, we have never said, or we've said it, but uh, we've always been saying that we're against focusing on territory, territorial swaps and border changes as a solution, simply because our analysis is that it will not lead to a sustainable solution, but will bring the dialogue into a deadlock. Uh, and then it will be quite difficult to relaunch and reset it again. So uh, we actually didn't think it's necessary to say uh, that uh, talks about border changes in the Balkans, in the wider region, in Europe today, along ethnic lines or making it more along ethnic lines than before is dangerous and is detrimental to the security uh, of the region, but also detrimental to the security in Europe. And we are seeing that. There are talks suddenly, uh, the distinguished uh, president of Austria said uh, Southern Tyrolia is a success story, but we also heard certain politicians from Vienna saying that there should be double passports for uh, the German-speaking minority in Southern Tyrolia, uh, North and Italy. Um, and we had quite a reaction uh, to, that, uh, to that from Rome. This is totally uh, unnecessary for Europe to restart all those discussions again. And we also see that that is already a result of the Pristina-Belgrade uh, dialogue focusing suddenly on territory. 
Again, our position is that we do not see how that would solve any problem, uh, and we are uh, for the path of trying to solve the real problems, work on them, uh, and try to come to a solution. And uh, we see that already the effects of mere talks about it are quite uh, negative, and they have a negative dynamics in, in the region. So will it, uh, will it lead to something? Again, I believe that, uh, that uh, Balkans not only should get more mature, but they are getting more mature. So it is really uh, the sides that have to decide on their fate. It's simply that we do not believe that this will lead to anything. And we, were, we are very sorry that it has taken that course, because uh, we will need just more time, uh, just more time to come to a solution. Right. And, and again, I also want to say that I really have the feeling, did, would we have this talk in 2006, it would have been okay, but now we are in 2018 and now we have to live with, was, with what has happened since, uh, with different positions, with uh, things developing, and now finally solve the issue. Uh, to the benefit of, of all the people. Thank you. I'm going to give three minutes to Agon and then three minutes to Marco right after that, and then we'll go to Gordana. Thank you. Uh, see, this is my, like what I expressed earlier, this concern or this idea that this can, can wait. I very much appreciate uh, Germany's concerns on the basis of principles, uh, but I'm really skeptical that you know, if, this, if there is no agreement within this year, that we will uh, end up in a situation where we will not be able to see the end of this, we'll be stuck in a deadlock. You know, and some people have mentioned the parallel with the Macedonia scenario of the last decade, where we are stuck with these stabilocrats, I'd say in both, in both countries, uh, who are able to rule because they are able to securitize the problem, uh, and then there go also the values and the principles uh, we, are, uh, we are fighting for. So this idea that, you know, let's, uh, you know, there is time is really worrying and concerning, especially knowing the internal dynamics in Kosovo. Uh, I'm a, you know, it's, it's, it's becoming a little bit unsustainable. So, I, you know, what I would hope and at least appreciate from Germany is to, in this context, at least try to, if, if this border correction, and this is, in Kosovo, this is nobody's favorite or first opinion, not even President Tatsch's uh, first sort of solution, to go to a, another plan that is workable and that can be achieved within the next year. Now, going back to Mr. Juric's uh, uh, talk on, on the issue of compromise, now this has been the problem for throughout the last, sort of, let's, Brussels talk started as technical in 2011 or 12, and then the first agreement reached in 2013. They started as technical, uh, and then the more they progressed, they moved into political issues because the technical problems are always become political. Uh, from Kosovo's perspective, 2008 is a compromise, and this is often very forgot forgotten. Uh, it's not a unilateral declaration of independence, it's a multilateral. You know, it, it was done with the sponsorship and support of the West. It was con Kosovo's contract with the West. The agreement was, this is the territory that will be based on values, and these values provide, provide strong safeguards for the minorities. Serbia does not see that as a compromise, and throughout the last uh, years, the more the dialogue has continued, the more in sort of the geopolitical situation has changed and Serbia's leverage sort of has increased into neglecting the first compromise and saying that there is a need to, for more compromise. The problem is that, you know, Kosovo doesn't have any more to give, you know. It cannot exchange uh, its sort of problematic external position by creating something, you know, by uh, letting go something domestically like the uh, form of association of Serbian municipalities that Serbia thinks should be created, which with, with strong executive powers, territorial autonomy, it cannot become internally dysfunctional in order to sort of get this, uh, uh, get this property title at the UN. Uh, so then the only thing that kind of has been forced upon Kosovo is this issue of borders, which nobody actually wants and is, I would like to see not happen. Uh, but, can, you know, and uh, at least I would like, personally, I would not like to see it happen. But is that, the problem is, what's the bigger risk of just leaving this, you know, issue, you know, pushing the ball forward, the frozen conflict into a much more worsening environment? Uh, you know, and this is why I appreciate Germany's position, but 
what is happening in the EU, people are seeing that here, and it reflects into how people think here. You know, we are moving towards an EU where populists are not maybe maybe not winning, but in a way they are governing because they are frightening all the centrist parties, and you know, it's a stasis. You know, it's a, it's like a it's an it's an EU that is being. Uh, 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 sort of governed by this fear of enlargement, by this fear of, uh, of standing up for the, for the European values. So that naturally reflects here. Uh, uh, and there's this transatlantic divide, first of all, between the US and Germany over how they view the situation and how they want to see it solved. But there's also this French and German debate about the future of the EU. And we're, we're kind of stuck in this. And, uh, uh, and it doesn't look like it's going to get better. And when we think about solutions, we need to have in mind that we're pushing the ball for an environment that is even more problematic and that might reopen uh, everything once again. Now, I, I, I know this fear that border correction now or like these you know, uh, uh, territorial issues could have chain effects regionally. That is a very serious risk. But you know, if we push it further, will that risk go away? I'm not, I'm not really sure with the, with the way things, th things are going. So uh, my thinking on the border correction is that I think what has been attempted to be done by both leaders is a bit of, you know, we're used to this constructive ambiguity in the Balkans, uh, uh, where both sides can interpret differently. I think from Kosovo's perspective, it can only happen if it's just a constructive ambiguity for demarcation, in which you would have a little, you know, like, you know, there were various types of borders of Kosovo in the in former Yugoslavia where you could just, uh, 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 you know, a village here, a village there, as Wolfgang Petrich said. Uh, and that's the only thing that can actually pass in Kosovo. Um, nothing else, you know. If people think people here think that partition, just chopping off part of territory, can happen, that is first of all, you know, unjust, and it, it, it sets a horrible uh, example and uh, will have horrible impact. But it will also uh, it will also not be able to even it will not be feasible. You know, it, it cannot it cannot pass. So yeah. thank you, Marco. They're not convinced. Could you convince them? The question here is. I'm not in the business of convincing. The question here is uh, not whether we want to win an argument, but whether if we want to solve a problem. And these things are sometimes quite different. If we want to use, to make a heated debate about arguments and values and, uh, you know, how to, in words, come up as a winner in such a debate, it is one set of, of issues and arguments you use. But my question would be then if this is not, if the question of territory is not one of the core problems here, just like the question of status is one of the core unresolved issues. If these are not the core unresolved issues, why did then in 2008 such a huge part of the international community stand exactly behind the idea of changing the borders and taking a certain part of territory from Serbia. If it's not about territory, if it is today in 2018 not about territory, then probably the decision from 2008 also has been changed because in 2008 it was all about territory. It was all about our territory. And the, by, by the way, in 2008, it was just 10 years ago, we were a member of the United Nations recognized in our borders that included Kosovo and Metohia, and we were not an undemocratic government or undemocratic regime. It was almost 10 years after the end of the conflict. We were members of the Council of Europe, members of the OSCE, and had actually pro-Western democratic governments in power in a series of election cycles here in the moment it was decided in Pristina with support of some to take part of our territory. And it was all about ethnic question and all about territorial issues. After the end of certain other great conflicts that we had in European history in the 20th century, once the democratic issue was resolved, no one came to the countries that had such issues and asked them for additional territorial concessions. And I believe that this is also an important point. So the ground of values is a very slippery slope in this debate. Our ambition is to be fully concentrated on what is possible as a solution. 
I, hear, I heard here and I took well note of the argument that, for example, Kosovo Albanians don't want pieces of territory chopped off. Sorry, neither do the Serbs. What you see not fit for you, we don't see fit for us as well. But this means that we need to look for a solution, look for a compromise that will leave us both with achieving something, getting something in a civilized, peaceful way, not through a dispute. Otherwise, if anyone in Kosovo or in the international community expects that we would, on a silver plate, I repeat again, deliver the recognition of separation of 10,887 square kilometers of our sovereign territory and not to even achieve any kind of compromise for the Serbs, for Serbia, for the Serbs who live in Kosovo and Metohija. This is not realistic politics and there is no one uh, in the international community or in the world who can implement this to, to work. And this, remain, this leaves us into, in an unresolved situation that uh, then others with interests that are not equal as ours, which is to keep peace and stability, can exploit easily whenever they want. Thank you. I'm going to turn to Gordana. Uh, we heard something from Agon's analysis that if this doesn't fly, it doesn't happen. He is concerned that it might be uh, violence, there might be insecurity, there might be incidents. I said in my opening remarks about the incidents we already have seen before. It's very hard to believe that someone really wants normalization when those things happen. So what should be the responsibility of leaders, A, or opinion makers, B, in this regard? Are the societies ready for the deal? It doesn't look like it from, this was very civilized by the way, I appreciate your uh, debate here, but are the societies ready for the deal and what is the responsibility of the leaders? Well, I can start with an offer to the audience. You take your right hand and put it in a fist and try to shake hands with the person next to you, also holding a fist. That's dialogue, as it is. People can't shake hands with their fists, but they are pretending that they are doing it. And that's what, more or less, is an essence in uh, what we are describing as Brussels dialogue. Are societies ready? Yes. Both. Both. Yes. But they are not allowed to have the voice. And they don't. And here is an evidence. We have the story of swapping territories. So you didn't have a voice in Serbia, for example, where you have Kosovo labeled, so-called Kosovo labeled as Kosovo is heart of Serbia. So which part of that heart is going away? You have a population in Kosovo that heard that we should maybe swap territories. So which part of hardly got so-called Kosovo independent, they, will, they are ready to give up. And uh, nobody knows what would people here and there would say because nobody asks them, because we are told that you can shake hands with your fists. Unfortunately, you can't. Second point, we are all labeling European Union as a group of people with failed idea on the Brussels dialogue and what has happened so far and what was achieved. And um, I disagree. Whatever I may have as a remarks on whatever Europeans have been doing for lately. Because, you know, we wouldn't be sitting here, civilized men are talking to each other, if there were no very few people believing in basis in European idea that's dialogue and bring people together in one room, however they may dislike each other. Some of these very few people are sitting in this room. They made it happen, not hold soil, blood, ideas and territories, but those hardworking women mostly, I must say, who gathered us and we started to come to Berge to go to Pristina, go around, etc. So that's the basic of European idea. Uh, why dialogue so far? 
didn't deliver peace building in the field because we don't want it. And very few of us are ready to say that we don't want it because there is a horrible future then that might be the beginning of new era that Serbs and Albanians can truly live together, marry each other, have common life on the same ground. That horrifies a lot of people here and there. And that's why I'm talking about um, resolving all the difficult heritage that we share, calling it, labeling it as the beginning of the era, not as the end of the era in the wars and atrocities and war crimes and fighting for soil and blood in former Yugoslavia. There's a huge difference because most of this civilized dialogue was perspective of ending the era of the war and I'm talking about beginning the era of peace and I'm weak, nobody supports me, hardly anyone wants to vote for me but if there were no people like me you wouldn't be sitting right here and you wouldn't be able to try to exercise that simple act, try to shake your hands with your fists. That is what most of the very important people are doing when they are delivering the news on Brussels Dialogue. And I'm ending with a um, sentence that I cannot avoid. Um, if you listen very powerful people in my region, I mean strongmen, don't take them seriously because they don't take my life as a citizen seriously. So that's a label for the future. The minute you start not to take them seriously will be the minute where voice of the people in Kosovo and here in Serbia will be here more loud. Most of the time they pretend and um, I think that they should be told stop to pretend on having high level politics, big partners, big money, etc. and start really to deliver um, to the people that they were elected by to resolve the hard time, the hard heritage that we share, Serbs and Albanians here. Thank you. We have 20 minutes. I want to take some questions from the audience. Uh, let's take three and then see how far we go. Do we have a microphone? There is a very tall hand over here in the middle. Here's a microphone coming to you. Then there is over there after that. Please introduce yourself. And just a question, don't do speeches. Yeah, if you yeah, want to do I, speech, I, I, organize your own I panel. I want to do speeches. Uh, Lazar okay. Akic, I come, I come from North Kosovo. I have a question for uh, Ilir and uh, Agon. Uh, first to Ilir, uh, a straightforward question. Do you think uh, whether Kosovo has uh, a perspective without Serbia's recognition in terms of EU perspective, in terms of uh, membership into uh, UN, Council of Europe, which relates to further uh, issues, security, rule of law, economic development, and so on and so forth. So does Kosovo have, has future without Serbia's recognition? And for Agon, uh, you said that the deal, the, the, the deal won't pass. Uh, so can you tell us, do you think that there will be any political elite in Serbia which can deliver uh, recognition of Kosovo in its current borders and yet politically su survive that move? Okay. Thank you. Uh, I, I see a hand over there. I don't know how far the microphone can travel. Oh, it's there already. Hello everyone, my name is Marco. I have a, a simple question for Alex, you can deliver it to who you think should answer it. When will we stop with the games? On both sides. That's one question. And the other question is, uh, we, 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 we have been talking about peace. Uh, exactly nine months and two days ago, a person was killed in Kosovo. Oliver Ivanovic was killed there. We are talking about peace and peace building. One, the second question is, is, goes after that. When will we start, start talking about what we have in common and stop talking about our differences? Thank you. Well, there's a, uh, one more question here. Could you please stand up? Do we have a, a mic? I 
name, please introduce yourself. I'm Naim Leo, Institute for European Affairs. Uh, question to Ms. Stocher and Ms. Juric. Uh, do you think that uh, Pristina Belgrade dialogue is hardly influencing uh, Serbian membership to the EU, but also Kosovo perspective to become a member of the EU, since Serbia is now uh, negotiating for more than four years, but it's not even uh, opened the half of the chapters, uh, and the 2025 doesn't seem that realistic anymore. So do you think that this uh, uh, negotiation is also burdening the European perspective of both societies. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I have to say that Oliver Ivanovich used to be a faithful participant in these panels, and that's a personal loss for the forum as well. So I would just had to say this, and that he's dearly missed by people in this audience. Uh, so let's start. Uh, Ilir, you were first. Um, no, 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 I'll speak in English. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, I think that approach, when you ask that question, I was reminded of 2006, when during the status talks led by President Atisari, Serbia decided to unilaterally have its own constitution and prejudge the outcome of those negotiations, you know, thinking that we would never declare independence. So uh, our EU perspective is closed because of um, the five EU non-recognizing countries. You know, th they are the problem and they are not supporting Serbia's position, but they have their own interpretation of what happened in former Yugoslavia. Regardless, I think they should be more responsible to the Western Balkans. Every European country has a shared responsibility for the wider peace stability in this region. And I think that we shouldn't look at our uh, quest for normalization under the terms of, if I don't do this, you will not get there. Uh, obviously, we are stuck. Uh, we need a way out. Uh, w w the present situation doesn't offer a way out uh, and we need to do it for us, not for Europe, not for European membership, not for UN membership uh, <laughs> for that matter. We need to do it for us. Uh, and I don't see how can anybody uh, be spiteful about uh, 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 both of our countries being one day partners in Partnership for Peace missions. You know, I don't see that as a big problem one day to aspire to that or uh, a common position in United Nations about particular issues, right? If we look at it towards equality and what we get out of it, then we wouldn't be talking about what we are talking today. And Marco, thank you. <laughs> uh, yes, uh, you know, that's my question too. When are when is everybody going to cut these games? And I will uh, my belief is that our societies have the answer to that. Because uh, politicians um, who have nothing else to offer but poison, uh, the poisonous rhetoric, will, they want the situation to last 10 years, 15 years, because they have nothing else to offer to what Gordana said, everyday citizens, right? And meanwhile, you look at polls and you see that almost half of our societies are not happy with the state of economic affairs where we live. Really? Well, you know, uh, so we have to think seriously about that. Uh, uh, and uh, we were all uh, shocked and sad when Oliver Ivanovich uh, was killed. We don't know who killed him. We know why he has, we may speculate why he has been removed, and it's actually about the topic that we are discussing here today. That's why he's removed. I don't know whom, but I want to know who did it, and who told that person to remove a politician in 21st century in a European, in Europe. You know, that's a, 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 it's not somewhere there in the margins happening, but it's in, in, in Europe, in the middle of Europe. Um, and um, <clears throat> I would like to share a story about Oliver, a human, if you'd say 30 one, seconds. One minute. Um, in 2003, when, two, when children were, were killed in Gorazdevac, uh, there was an initiative by Kosovo Civil Society to have a march with flowers uh, to Gorazdevac, uh, to, to offer sympathy to the Serbs and to uh, show how much we are against it. Uh, Oliver it was in support of it, but the then Serbian government and the then Office for uh, Kosovo stopped it. Uh, 
I think that uh, because they deemed that it's not in their interest. Uh, so he knew, uh, he, he, today he would, have, he would have been important in this debate because he would have strengthened the pluralism of Kosovo Serbs, which we miss nowadays a lot, a pluralistic view, political view, to what's uh, not going on, if I could say. Thank you. Thank you. Marco. I agree. This is one of the points we obviously agree on. We do miss Oliver Ivanovic, and he was one of the voices of the Serbs in Kosovo and Metohija. We also do not forget the fact that he was for more than three years imprisoned by the authorities there with the participation of Ulex on baseless charges that were in our view politically motivated. We do not forget this. He was fighting for his ideas. He sacrificed everything that a man can sacrifice for these ideas and he will be remembered. This is one point. Regarding the European integrations of Serbia, Serbia has, in the context of the Brussels Agreement, been monitored through Chapter 35. And long have gone the days when there were remarks, objections, or pressures because Serbia maybe did not up to the last level implement every aspect it was due to implement of these agreements. Serbia has fully lived up to its commitments stemming from the first Brussels agreement and the only major remaining unimplemented issue from the first Brussels agreement is the community of Serb municipalities. Last week we marked 2,000 days since the community of Serb municipalities was agreed but was not implemented or delivered by the authorities in Pristina. And this has been merely mentioned at our panel. Uh, I do believe that this is an important aspect still left to be implemented of the first agreement. And the fact that majority of the people uh, in the public sphere here or there does not approve does not mean that the officials who undertook the commitment don't need to, to work on it. I do believe that uh, in every major conversation we have with EU officials or other, some member state officials, the topic of Kosovo often comes up. And it would be really bad if for a prolonged period of time this topic would overshadow other aspects of our European integrations which are extremely important, which are about the reforms of our institutions, about rule of law, about improving various standards of our society uh, that bring benefit to the citizens. Uh, we want to create a better society for ourselves. We believe we need Europe, but we also believe Europe needs us. Thank you. Agon. Thank you. Uh, let me ask, answer first Lazar's question on will Serbia ever recognize Kosovo within these borders? Is that feasible? I think President Vucic made it fairly clear a few weeks ago when he said he could do that in exchange for EU accession now. Uh, <laughs> so I think uh, the problem is that now the EU isn't, so it's, the accession process is not, you know, the EU doesn't do that. So we as Kosovo live as a bargaining ship. Our life is a bargaining ship uh, for Serbia. So uh, uh, I can see a scenario where that happens. Uh, the problem is that uh, um, uh, if it's not now, then if it's not Germany or the other EU countries willing to give this concession uh, uh, in exchange for, uh, for recognition, then, uh, then it at the current moment, Kosovo is the one that has to, to give something, and uh, the problem is that Kosovo is in a tight spot in terms of what it can afford or would be able to give. Now, I'm talking here, it's very hard to talk, you know, we're not living in normal times, you know, and a lot of the analysis on the region is normative in terms of values and the, what we believe, and we believe in multi-ethnic states, we believe in, in a liberal Western Balkans, most of us here at least. Uh, so it's hard to talk this, this, uh, you know, this harsh, brutal, realist reality. But, so I'm going to try to make an assessment 
on what could pass as an agreement in Kosovo and why I think President Thatcher kind of thought this uh, could fly, uh, you know. I said partition cannot pass as an agreement. I think Mitrovica, uh, leaving Mitrovica out of Kosovo cannot pass as an agreement. That would be the true uh, uh, death of a multi-ethnic Kosovo. It would leave Kosovo Serbs without an urban gravitation center. Uh, 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 so that is, I, even as an analyst, as a cold-blooded analyst, I don't see that happening. That's why I thought she proposed, is sort of counterbalancing that with the border correction, which because I think he believes that that is able to pass because we are unfortunately still a very nationalistic society. And that's why he's proposing to put it on a referendum. Uh, so uh, people in Kosovo today are against. Yes, it's true, 80% have said in the poll that they are against border correction, but because I think there's a caveat there because they don't still know what it means. Uh, there's a lot of mistrust on President Thatcher on, on, you know, as a colleague said one day, if he tries to sell flowers, people will think they are plastic. Uh, so uh, uh, people, what, what that 80% thinks is that, that the North is gone uh, because the process has not moved forward enough for people to understand what, comes else, what else comes with it. Is it UN seat? Is it, you know, what, what happens to, you know, is it only just opening the gates for, for EU accession? So, I think the perception on that uh, 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 could change. Now, what can we do to, to, sort, of, uh, to, to sort of avoid that? Uh, Mr. Juric mentioned the association of Serbian municipalities here as somehow being uh, not implemented. The problem is that, that we have a fundamental, uh, the sides have a fundamental disagreement on what they have agreed upon because Serbia signed an agreement which says the ASM has to be reviewed by the Constitutional Court of Kosovo. The Constitutional Court of Kosovo gave its evaluation of the agreement and effectively uh, turn the ASM into an, N an NGO type of entity of coordination. So, um, uh, so now Serbia is expecting Kosovo to implement something that, that you know, is not part of the agreement. Uh, I'll leave it at that because I see you. Uh, yeah, I'm so sorry. The, I, I, this is not a great job trying to look at this clock and trying to rush you. Sabine, I'm going to rephrase the question a little bit about the EU. Can a process be successful without a clear EU perspective? Ilir says we don't have one. Uh, someone else says we don't have one for Kosovo. So can the process be successful when both sides uh, or one of the sides doesn't have a clear EU perspective? I, I don't share the, the assumption that there is not a clear uh, perspective. There's a very clear perspective for the region. Uh, and uh, the, the problem that it is being phrased, or it was lately phrased in, for example, the Sofia Declaration as for the region and not the states, that is a problem of the non-recognizers, uh, which they have calling Kosovo a state, which is their position at the moment, which has very little to do with the Serbia, Kosovo, Belgrade, Pristina problem, but has a lot to do with their own sort of assessment of their own situation and they take their policy decisions. However, there is no doubt that when we talk about uh, the, the European perspective for the region, it is about including Kosovo, of course. Uh, but then we come to, to the question. Uh, it is very clear that um, this, uh, this issue has to be solved and the conflict has to be solved if both Belgrade and Pristina, uh, we, I would call it Serbia and Kosovo, uh, solve their bilateral issue because the European Union will not take any country in uh, as good as it may perform uh, if, uh, with, with open conflict. And that has been said many times. Um, so I, I can only repeat it, uh, but uh, there is also no question that this perspective is there. Um, and if you allow me a small commentary, yes, we did not speak about ASMM here. We did also not speak about energy, which is something you know Germans like uh, like um, to raise uh, also. But that is because we heard that solution is territory and status, and. Uh, the, the offer several times uh, to talk about substance, uh, to see that there are many issues that have to be resolved, including rights of Kosovo Serbs, uh, was, was not taken. And, and we continue to hear that uh, the garden knot will be solved and everything will be solved when we talk about territory. And it just proves that um, we, we don't believe that that is the case. Thank you. My clock is telling me that it's one hour, 29 minutes since we started. I'm going to take just one minute because I don't know whether you answered the question of the panel or not. I think we understand better the complexity of the issue. But I'm going to ask you one last question, all of you. Please take only one minute, really one sentence. Uh, 
your prediction for the state of affairs in 2019. And don't worry, we'll treat your prediction the same way we treat the weather forecast. We're skeptical, but we need to know it. And I don't know a better group of people than you to give us an educated forecast. I'm going to start with Marko Djuric. He is the best person at this panel to give us a very educated forecast. So very quickly, what is your prediction for the state of affairs in 2019? And it's a weather forecast. I'm probably not the best futurologist, but uh, my guess would be that uh, in 2019 we would have a new, new Europe, basically. We would have new balance of power in Brussels in many aspects. I cannot predict in what direction this will go. No one probably can. But uh, this means that we have a relatively narrow, so to say, window of, of opportunity to use the time until uh, mid next year to work with the European Commission and with the people in Brussels to try and resume what we can and to implement what we can from the dialogue and to resume the talks on a more comprehensive solution. So my best guess would be that we would still have peace, we would still have some time to go until we reach some major agreement, but we would have at least narrowed the gap a bit. This may not be satisfactory, no revolutionary breakthrough, but... It still is not raining with dogs and cats. Yes. So, no, no, not heavy rain, no thunderstorms. Good. Uh, Ilir, your prediction for 2019? Well, Someone your prediction, at me. Your prediction uh, about the Brussels dialogue, you're satisfied with your prediction from 2018. I think I, my, so. my prediction for 2019 as regards to Kosovo is we will definitely have new national elections most likely a new government. And if uh, European member states and the US don't fill the vacuum that's, that will be left with, uh, where, in EU, in Brussels, then we will most likely be waiting for the new uh, 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 common and security for, uh, foreign policy uh, commissioner to take its office and learn about the process, uh, which I think and this is um, not necessarily a very positive scenario, but I, th I hope, now I hope, uh, that in that realistic 2019, everyone involved uh, in politics will finally uh, understand <coughs> that we cannot drag on uh, with this process forever. Thank you. Gordana, your prediction for 2019, very, very briefly. More of what we have been already witnessing for the last uh, um, seven or, or, or 11 years and less of everything what we would like to see and that means uh, ownership uh, of the process and um, I think more of what people here and there are already, already working on that's creating an environment in, in society, in public, for their announcement and wisdom. I would like to see more ownership and uh, whether anybody likes it or ask me, I will work on it. Thank you. I've got your prediction for 2019. Uh, as I said I'm earlier, I've you're the only <laughs> analyst here. So <laughs> You know, it's, it's, a, it's really concerning, uh, the situation. I, I, I fear that we will see increasing incidents as we've seen in this year inside Kosovo. I fear we will see attempts to sort of maybe create new realities on the ground. And, uh, uh, and if in the past year these incidents have passed without escalating further, you know, in the next year they might not, or starting from now, including 2018 as well. Uh, what I fear is that, uh, I also share this fear that if we are leaving a final agreement for after uh, this com Commission's mandate, the values and the principles that we are worried about most right now and uh, which Germany is sort of taking the lead on and uh, uh, it will be less able to fight for those principles and values 
in the next phase uh, because we will see an EU coming in that will be an EU of stasis of, of, of uh, you know, of uh, not inspiring enlargement. Now I understand, and, and, and the values we're kind of aspiring to. And, and I understand the, the concerns and the comments by many, and even in the previous panels that, you know, well, the Balkans, we should Europeanize on our own. Uh, and that is true. We, this is our internal battle and we should keep fighting for these things. But, uh, you know, the periphery, it's really hard to fight for these values from the periphery when the core is cracking. And, uh, and uh, that's, that's my fear. I fear the core is cracking and that, you know, just like, you know, when communism fell, we didn't bring it down. It kind of fell apart and then we just... <laughs> so I'm, I'm really worried about the next year. Thank you. Sabine, your prediction. I allow myself to be a little bit more optimistic. Uh, first, uh, I have heard in this room today many people saying that we are looking for a definitive solution of the problem, uh, and that is already a lot of common ground. I also uh, would predict that the international community, which maybe from here looks uh, as being very demi divided, has a lot of common ground on this issue, um, and that is uh, that a comprehensive solution, a sustainable solution, and a solution that contributes to regional stability uh, should come about, and uh, I've also been encouraged by uh, what Marco Juric said, uh, that we need a comprehensive solution. So I would expect that the talks resume, uh, and uh, in the spirit uh, that uh, there is need for coming, getting closer to a, to a solution, to an agreement, uh, in 2019 we will see uh, an active negotiation about uh, the issues. Thank you. Well, my prediction that in 2019 we're going to have another BSF, and uh, hopefully another panel on this very difficult topic, and hopefully two hours, not an hour and a half, please. Uh, and uh, I want to thank you for being such great panelists. I understand it's difficult for you. For some of you, it's a very sensitive process in which you are involved. And I want to thank you for being an excellent audience. What do we have lunch now? Enjoy it.